Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist as well as a blouse fixer. And um, I have been doing this for face for uh, mental health on the mighty for quite a while. Um, gosh, we're going into five years. No, four years, four years, four years in the fall. And I could not be more delighted to be here. Um, today, we're going to be talking about PTSD and also complex PTSD. Hello, Crystal and hello, Tabusum. Tabusum, Tanya, hi. So glad y'all are here. Um, I'm from Arkansas and I've been a clinical psychologist since 1993 is when I got my license. So that's a long time ago. And I've been doing this for, um, you know, I've, I've loved doing therapy. I've been mostly therapy, been in private practice for years. And I um, have learned so much from my patients. I told someone the other day on an interview that I feel like I am a conduit between people, like the people that I see. And I, they have a certain problem and then someone else may come in two or three years later. And I think, OK, so I learned this. I saw this person learn this. I'm just going to be kind of a bridge, a conduit between this person and that person. And that's really what I think I do. I have learned something along the way. But I love to share what I've learned from other people over that 27 year period of time. Um, let's see anything else about me. I've been on social media for eight years. I started uh, blogging in 2012 when my son left for college, my only son left for college and my initial uh, website was on empty nest. And, but since then back in 2014, I began uh, writing a uh, writing blog post about mental health at drmargaretrutherford.com where I still am. Hi, Anne. Thanks for being here. Anne's in my Facebook closed group. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then I started podcasting in 2016, the same year I started doing these Facebook lives for the mighty. And um, let's see. So I'm at drmargaretrutherford.com. My podcast is the self work podcast with guess who Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I have a Facebook profile page that I'd love for y'all to jump onto uh, again, Dr. Margaret Rutherford after Facebook. So, um, a lot of ways I'm on social media. I do have a new book called Perfectly Hidden Depression. And um, oh, I don't have a copy of it anymore in here. It's called Perfectly Hidden Depression, How to Break Free from the Perfectionism that Masks Your Depression. I'm very passionate about the topic. I believe that often perfectionism on this day and age is a cloak that can really com com completely expertly um, uh, hide real depression, but it doesn't look like classic depression. It looks like someone's very successful and very caring and very loving, but they can have suicidal thoughts. They can have um, untreated trauma. They can have all kinds of problems. So anyway, um, I am, I, I'm passionate about that topic and I have done some Facebook lives on the mighty for that, which I'm very appreciative of them for doing. Um, but anyway, you can read more about that at drmargaretrutherford.com. So somebody is here, a first timer, Debbie Lewis. Hi, Debbie. Um, so glad to have you here. And today we're going to talk about um, post-traumatic stress disorder as well as complex post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and which are two separate things. I have some kind of interesting facts about PTSD. Let's first talk about, of course, what it is. PTSD requires for the diagnosis that you be um, that you be exposed to some kind of threat that is very outside of the ordinary, uh, usually involving some kind of uh, har horrible trauma. Obviously, we can think of war. We think of sexual assault, especially um, anything. You know, if you've lived through a tornado, if you've lived through uh, a, a burning at home or some of the fires I'm sure that have been in California, for example, have, have caused PTSD. Um, all kinds of things like that kind of trauma can exist. Um, 
Interestingly enough, one of my first fun facts, sort of fun facts, is that, however, only 15 to 20 percent of people will actually develop PTSD after such a trauma. Most of us don't. And a lot of that is about your genetics, uh, your family, the, your history of previous trauma. Um, Haley, hi, you're the first time here, too. Got some first timers. I'm Dr. Margaret. I'm so glad to have you here. So that's kind of interesting. And when you think, of course, what's happening now in this pandemic, this is obviously very traumatic. Uh, not only the pandemic, but also the rioting, although um, so many of us feel like that is very justified and understandable. At the same time, I just talked to a young man, a, a young host of a podcast who was interviewing me, and he said he left his home. He's an a African-American, and he said, for the first time, I was very afraid to leave my home. So, you know, different things are are acting now as trauma and the pandemic is definitely one of them. There are different uh, affective or emotional symptoms that have to do with PTSD. There can be a numbing or there can be hyper arousal and hyper vigilance. There can be a lot of mood swings. There can be um, a flattening of, of emotion. Um, there can be all kinds of things that happen emotionally. They can be very isolative. You can get agitated and angry. Uh, I read somewhere in my research for this article that there could be over 600,000 actually presentations, unique presentations of PTSD. So I'm obviously not going to cover 600,000 of them here. So, um, but that is, it, it's it, not everybody develops it. It's not a weakness to develop it. It is also, it's a neurological condition in that we'll talk about that in a minute, how, what happens to your neurobiology when you're actually getting triggered. Uh, there's also a component where you can have flashbacks and nightmares about the actual event. And the flashbacks, of course, make you feel like you're actually living through the event. My uh, one, of, one of my ex-husbands, I'm not proud of that fact, but um, he was uh, served in Vietnam. And I'll never forget one night um, uh, he came in rushing into our bedroom and was covering me up like I was uh, about to be shot with shrapnel or some kind of um, uh, some gunfire. And he said, get down, get down, you know, and he was having a flashback. And so, um, so in which he, unfortunately, I don't believe ever got treated for. Maybe he did after we separated. I hope he did. He needed treatment. Um, so there can be, uh, trauma, you know, reenactments of the trauma where you actually see yourself doing those things, or you can have nightmares. Um, there also can be cognitive or mental components of it where you, um, you get very depressed or anxious. Um, you can have a lot of anxiety. You can have, again, irritability. Your thinking can be disturbed. Um, you can be dissociative um, as well when it's really severe. Uh, you can grow more paranoid, unfortunately. Um, you know, it can turn into a real distrust and hypervigilance. Um, or actually, and these are, we'll get more into these, but there are all kinds of things that can develop. And we think, you know, PTSD is mostly military, but actually, second fact, um, there's more sexual assault that is actually the number one leading, leading cause of post-traumatic stress disorder. Let me check these out. Um, Sharice, okay, so I didn't go on a cruise vacation due to the coronavirus pandemic global. When is it over? Well, I don't know when it's over, um, but certainly dealing with the ambiguity of all that. Uh, a firefighter, water rescue male has PTSD. How can a friend's spouse help? Okay. Um, for one thing, you can help them label it as PTSD. PTSD is not going crazy. It's, it's not the same as you're seeing and hearing things that aren't there. This is built on some kind of event that you have had in your life that has become traumatic. I used to, uh, I used to treat um, firefighters and paramedics here in this area uh, from PTSD. I had a, a former patient who was um, a, a, one of the chiefs of the fire department and he used to send people to me. And they had come upon some sort of accident or something that was just for them the breaking point. They may have come up on a myriad of other things. And so, but first you want to, and they will think this is weakness. I, I, I'm I, supposed to be stoic through this. All my um, brothers and sisters in the department 
we don't get upset about this kind of thing. That's, you know, something we're taught not to do. We're taught to go toward the fire. We're taught to go toward the accident um, and not have an emotional reaction to it. In fact, the firefighters would tell me nobody needs to come into our fire department because we all laugh and joke about in the crudest fashion about the most horrific of things. And that's how we handle the emotions of it. So one, you can help him or her see that, um, there is something called PTSD and they, they have it. It's not a weakness um, and that they can be healed. They can, there are a lot of really good things that can help. And we'll go over those in a second. Um, Cherise, I have PTSD. When do I want help? Well, um, the timing of, of getting help for PTSD is actually the sooner the better. Um, for example, I have rape victims that I often uh, see and they'll say uh, it was a month, a year ago. And I'd much rather deal with someone who ha it happened last week than someone who uh, dealt with a year ago because or experienced it a year ago. Because it is actually in the retelling of it and the reprocessing of the trauma in a safe environment where you can begin to, to really heal. Uh, let's go over before I ask, uh, answer any more questions. Uh, maybe because of the sexual assault, women are twice as likely to get PTSD. Um, the interesting thing is also the impact on the person is not directly um, tied to or connected with the actual severity of the trauma, which that means is that something could have a huge impact on you that isn't as quote unquote rationally as severe a trauma. It is a very unique response to something. Um, and so, and, and actually we don't, sometimes we don't think of traumas. Like for example, I went to a trauma workshop one time and I had my tonsils taken out when I was about 14 months old. I actually had a, a disorder that was killing me. They thought I had leukemia and it was my tonsils that were infected. But um, I'd never thought of that as trauma. And the woman looked at me and she goes, you were 14 months old. At that point, children were left in hospitals by themselves. Their parents just left them there. So I was left alone. I had this, I was strapped down. I had an operation that, you know, it wasn't ever explained to me. Of course, I was too young. And so it was a trauma and it had some effects later in my life, which I don't need to go into. But it really helped me to begin to understand things as traumatic. Um, let's go through, again, some of the uh, facts. Um, there are actually four kinds of stress responses, and people, you know, will, will not be so hard on themselves if they fought or they fled, fight or flight. They'll say, oh, now I know those responses to stress, but there are two others. One is fold and one is freeze. And so many people who freeze and fold will say to themselves, I didn't do anything. I just froze like a deer in the headline, but you did do something. You survived and that's what you did. And more people actually freeze than they fight or they flee because often fighting and fleeing is more dangerous than freezing. You actually may not survive if you fight or you flee. Um, this is so interesting to me. The average amount of time between the actual event occurring and a diagnosis of PTSD is 12 years. So Sharice, this is to your question. Many, many people have trauma and they get misdiagnosed. Um, they get misdiagnosed as bipolar disorder, anxiety disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, or just plain on, or even a schizophrenia. So, um, PTSD is one of those things that for a long time people did not see was all that um, big a deal and yet uh, or they didn't see it as a significant diagnosis although it's been a diagnosis for a long time it was under anxiety disorders for a long time though and I think that's probably what led it to have some misdiagnoses because it's actually much more of a trauma-based uh, disorder than it is anything else. Um, there's something called intergenerational PTSD, where it's passed down through your DNA, uh, which is very interesting. Okay, so there are about 10 more. Let me let me look at these questions. Uh, Seal, for you.
both. EMDR is eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy, which is a wonderful therapy for trauma and certainly for PTSD. Gwen, um, yes, you could still have PTSD. Uh, you're welcome, Alex. I think medical trauma is undertreated. It is severe. It requires more understanding and treatment. Oh, you're talking about like my uh, operation. I do too. Um, I've certainly I, I worked with someone um, several years ago now that went in for some sort of gastrointestinal procedure and she woke up having had brain surgery because um, they that she had a neurological event during her abdominal surgery and she also woke up and instead of being neatly sewn up, she was sort of, for any of you who have uh, qualms about hearing this, maybe don't listen, but literally her, she was just sort of split open and her wound had to be, you know, dressed. And it was, it was horrible, horrible. And she had PTSD after that. She couldn't go into the hospital. Women who nearly died during pregnancy, I mean, during birth, PTSD, they cannot go back in the hospital um, or they can't, you know, they, any, anything. I mean, I, I've had, I've had a patient, believe it or not, years ago who fell down a well it was a well that was undiscovered i mean it was un no uh, there was no label on it there was no flags or pipes or anything he was down in there for like over a day terrible ptsd with anything having depth to it he couldn't look up because he'd spent a day looking up he couldn't look down and his parents didn't understand they thought he was being a wuss he was a good old arkansas boy and you know, I had to meet with his family and say this was horribly traumatic for him. And he was had spiders and snakes and all that stuff that he had to deal with. So there are some just lifetime events, lifetime things that can happen. It doesn't have to be war or sexual assault. It can be very traumatic. Um, sound book. Hold for technical difficulties. Okay. Um, Vicki, you say you have generalized anxiety, bipolar, borderline, and PTSD. I have them all. Um, you may. I don't know who you are. I, you've never been in my office. What I would begin to wonder, however, is if either someone is not really being very specific in what they think you need treatment for. Um, certainly, a lot of these things have overlapping symptomatology, and, a, and an evaluation can help someone determine which of those things is really primary because one people can get over medicated if they're, if they have four different things that they are um, being treated for. Now I will say that oftentimes when you, uh, when you're diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, uh, insurance companies will not pay for treatment for that because it's a personality disorder, but they will pay for bipolar disorder. They will pay for something else. So often, and, and actually, the, the symptomatology is very similar. So people aren't lying when they say you have bipolar disorder, but they are, um, they're wanting to get paid for the work. So they will call it bipolar. Um, it may not be, it may sound like something unethical, but it's really, um, you know, people with borderline personality disorder need a lot of help. We're going to talk about complex PTSD and we're going to talk about how different it is between um, bipolar, uh, borderline personality disorder as well in a minute. Um, hopefully the sound is better now. You're from Kentucky. Oh, good. It's working now. What do you think is something that would be good to ask a client during an intake that could help reduce the risk of misdiagnosing someone with PTSD? Wow. You must be a, a treater of some kind. Um, well, a lot of people discount trauma. In the book that I 
I don't need to bring up the book, but um, a lot of people with who believe who have a lot of stigma around depression or anxiety won't won't say that anything traumatic has happened to them. Um, a, a, a a patient comes to mind that I've mentioned probably on these uh, uh, Facebook lives, um, but she it was about her fourth session in, and she said to me, "You remember when you asked me if I'd ever had any sexual abuse in the first session?" I said, "Yes." So I've been thinking about that, and um, you know, there was something that happened that maybe I should mention. And she went on to describe um, an ex experience that she'd had when she was in a bar and she, someone um, put something in her drink and drug her out or got her out somewhere on a beach. It was a beach bar and raped her. And she woke up about three o'clock in the morning, all disheveled and had obviously been raped. She told no one. Um, she went to college the next week, had a great college career. She was a beauty pageant kind of person, and she uh, she developed eating disorders that were by, and the eating disorder was why she'd come in. It had never occurred to her that that was trauma, never. And so she kind of flinched even when I said, well, you know, so you have to get kind of specific with people. Now, obviously, you can't cover all 600,000 things that PTSD can look like. But what you can say is things like, rather than just ask, asking the simple question, have you ever had trauma in your life? You can say things like, has anything ever happened to your life that probably doesn't happen to everybody? You've never heard anybody else talking about it. And, you know, they might say, yeah, a tornado ripped through our, our, our um, neighborhood or, um, uh, yeah, my, you know, my, my cousin died in front of me. He was on a tractor and he, he fell off and he died. So yeah, I guess that doesn't happen to many people. So you can sort of ask them in words that they don't have to call it trauma at first. They can just call it an unusual experience. And then you can say, so how did you handle that? You know, how did that affect you? Um, and if they say not much, then you have a clue that something's going on. A huge clue. Um, hey, Cassandra, why does trauma often get repressed? Well, I've written a whole book about that. <laughs> why questions are sometimes hard to answer because they're multifaceted. Uh, it could be very easily that um, they, again, like the example I just gave, that it never occurred to her to call something trauma. People who research trauma have things called big T and little t. And big T is th are things that, big trauma, are things that everybody would call trauma. Little t are things that are still traumatic, like my operation perhaps on my tonsils, but they don't recognize it as such. Bullying is one of those things. I just did a podcast on bullying. Um, uh, you know, um, I don't know how anybody would consider a pandemic little t, but perhaps some people do. Maybe if you've never, you haven't had anyone die from COVID. Um, but again, you know, people, people don't necessarily want to think that something has happened or they don't want to recognize something that's trauma because they feel like they'll look like they're feeling sorry for themselves. Or uh, they'll think that, oh, I'm going to sound like I think I'm a victim and we're supposed to be so stoic. And so people will say, well, no, 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 that wasn't trauma. That was just a, it was a hard thing. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, I've talked with women who've had multiple miscarriages and they don't call it trauma, but they lose baby after baby after baby after baby. And, um, you know, they're just supposed to stay okay about it. And I think that that kind of stigma is huge still here in our culture. It's getting better. The more people talk about it, it's getting better. Um, but there is, um, you know, there's something I think also maybe people don't think that you can heal. So it's like saying that I have something that's going to be wrong with me for the rest of my life. And that's simply not true. You know, um, I know that there are movies now about people with bipolar disorder. The Oh, gosh, what was the most recent one that was something about a diary? Ah, oh, goodness, I have a terrible. I, so I've been in a lot of plays. I can't even remember the name of the plays I've been in. Um, 
But anyway, bipolar disorder is getting a played out on the screen a little bit better where we understand it. And we think about bipolar, why am I calling it bipolar? Well, yeah, bipolar disorder is one of those things that's being um, uh, depicted. So is PTSD. But we think about PTSD as being about anger. PTSD is not always about anger. It can be about anger, but it also can be that someone just walks around with a lot of grief. We tend to think of PTSD as that untrustworthy, hypervigilant man or woman who's been uh, in Afghanistan or Iraq and doesn't trust anybody and carries a firearm and, and, and you know, has a stockpile of ammunition at home. Well, that's a very severe form of PTSD. But um, there are many, many, many less severe forms. So, um, and again, two times as many women have it as men. Um, okay, so uh, Anne says, I've read about complex PTSD being misdiagnosed as borderline personality disorder. Okay, um, let me go through the last characteristics of, of PTSD and then we'll move on to complex PTSD. Again, I've already said what a PTSD is not a dangerous diagnosis. The greatest help to someone with PTSD is social support. If you say, you know, you have this, it's not something you, you know, it's sort of periodic, it gets triggered. Let's talk about what your triggers are and see how we can manage those triggers. Get them help. Um, it obviously looks different. It's, again, no longer an anxiety disorder. Um, it's interesting also that PTSD often gets stored in the body as chronic pain. So there's a wonderful book called Bessel by Bessel van der Kolk called The Body Keeps the Score. And it is amazing how, what can happen. I, I will have um, massage therapists tell me about this, that they'll be working on someone's um, lower back or neck or shoulders. And there will be an emotional release of some kind when that happens. The body is remembering some kind of pain that it is almost stored in musculature, in, in whatever. And so, you know, um, I, I, Bessel van der Kolk's book is absolutely wonderful. If y'all want to get the audio book of it or something, it's really very helpful. Um, they also stress that... Uh, Real trauma is almost a brain injury. Your neural pathways are changed because of the trauma. So, um, and, and actually when you get triggered, what happens is in your prefrontal cortex, which is right up here, it's the last part of the brain that was ever developed. Um, and it is the kind that makes decisions, that tells you when something's dangerous, when you need to fight or flee or freeze or fold, when it helps you make decisions, it's your... It's more of yourself. It's it's more, you, you know, if you have a stroke in this area, it can be really damaging to your sense of identity and self. So that is what gets shut down. And so that's why you're thrown back into living out this flashback or living out this um, nightmare, even a reenactment. And because you're not in the present anymore, it's, it's, uh, it's not the same as dissociation, although it has some dissociative qualities to it. Because it's actually it's it's based on a real event. That's why. Um, yes. Um, the other thing is that the the longer you don't address it, I kind of touched on this before, the more potent it can grow. So you definitely want to lean into that anxiety, that pain, that fear, that anger, whatever it is. I've only I've only personally worked with a handful of soldiers. Um, we have a VA center here, so almost all of them go there. So I don't have a lot of, um, a lot of experience in dealing with military PTSD. I have a lot of experience dealing with sexual trauma and PTSD, and it takes a long time, especially again for your body and your neural pathways to get, um, re redesigned or sort of, uh, rechanneled into something where you not completely, aroused by every kind of trigger there is. Okay, now let's go to complex PTSD. Um, actually, complex PTSD has not been identified or classified as of yet as an actual diagnosis because I think it probably shares a lot of symptoms with other things, borderline personality disorder being chief among them as well as PTSD. But what 
I, I think it should be. I think uh, complex or complicated PTSD is, is really addressing more chronic long-term trauma that has happened over years. It's not necessarily a stint in Afghanistan or a, a, a rape or even a, a, when you were kidnapped and then you were let go, there was a beginning, a middle, and an end. Well, a long kidnapping, obviously, but if it was like a 24-hour period of time. Uh, and I'm not discounting that by any stretch of the imagination, but this is when this has happened over very long periods of time. Um, and so um, it it appears um, in lots of ways, it appears with you being unable to cope emotionally and this and also with with complex PTSD, you can kind of look like you're okay until you're very not okay, until you get triggered. So there's a real, sometimes you may see this person and they, they're really functioning well. And then other times they seem completely unglued. Um, so um, I think the major difference is that it is more long-term trauma and a response to that than to PTSD. And then we'll talk a little bit about how it's different from borderline personality disorder after I get to some of these um, high jewels. I don't know how to heal. I see a therapist weekly. Um, Jules, what I would wonder with you, of course, I don't know if you see it. You can see a therapist weekly, but is that therapist doing trauma work with you? Um, meaning, are they doing cognitive uh, reprocessing therapy? Are they doing EMDR? Do they know how to do it? Do you even talk about the trauma? I've had people come in and say, you know, I've, I had trauma in my life, and but I've been in therapy. And I'll say, so how did you address the trauma? Oh, we didn't. You didn't? Oh, I just told her it happened, but she seemed to just think that was okay. And obviously I was okay. And so we never talked about it. Well, that's a huge mistake. Uh, there are therapists who are a little overwhelmed by dealing with people who have had trauma in their background or who are living through trauma right now. And so they shy away from it. And that's, I, I don't have an excuse or a reason for that. Some people um, just don't know what to do with it. And so they avoid talking about it. Um, so if you're avoiding talking about it with your therapist, then I would either tell the therapist, we either need to start work on this, or I need to find a therapist that is much more comfortable and trained in doing trauma work. Again, EMDR, there's an EMDR certification um, that I would definitely, um, I don't have it myself. I have been trained in EMDR, but I was doing it at the same time I was writing my book. So I just couldn't do both. I am a firm believer in it though. But I would definitely want to work with somebody who had been certified in EMDR. Um, Gwen, guilt in comparison leads to oppression as well. I'm not sure what you mean by comparison. Um, um, you know, I, I think, I guess what you mean is that you can feel guilty that it could be, well, the trauma could be something you feel guilty for. For example, if survivor guilt is a huge trauma, I mean, you went through a trauma with someone else and they didn't make it. You were in a, you were in a, a car accident and your friend died who was driving or you were driving. Or um, you, um, I talked with someone just this week. He had had an argument with his friend like in the third grade. And so they hadn't gone to school together. They always walked to school together. And his friend, um, he was like, like I say, he was in the third grade. And he, um, his friend went to school with some other people on bicycles and he got hit and died on his way to school. And this person just had this guilt constantly. That was a trauma for him. He didn't see it happen. He heard it happen. He saw his family's reaction. He saw his, um, his, you know, his aunt's reactions. Actually, I believe this child was a cousin of his. And so, um, you know, all those things can be very traumatic. Um, you can see someone being murdered and you, you weren't being murdered and you didn't shoot them. But, you know, uh, that's what's, I mean, a lot of the things we're seeing on television right now, those things are traumatic and can have an impact. Um, it's debatable whether actual PTSD can be diagnosable PTSD can be by 
actually hearing about something happening and not seeing it yourself. But I've worked with a certain kind of what I would call PTSD that it's maybe a little milder, but still it's, it's in the realm of PTSD and it's, and it's, you, you heard something. I mean, um, so, and, and of course, um, these tapes of George Floyd and that kind of thing, um, we are all seeing it and people are, de and certainly uh, people in the African-American community are having a PTSD-like reaction and it's understandable. Um, can a person with BPD be helped by ECT? And if yes, then at what point is it decided that it would be helpful? Um, well, those kinds of decisions are mostly made by psychiatrists and I'm a psychologist. Um, you know, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, uh, used to be considered a really um, highly, you know, the the penultimate of of um, of treatments when all else fails try ECT. I think that it can be very effective uh, for severe depression that is almost uh, has caused a complete withdrawal from the world, um, some kind of sadness and apathy and melancholy that cannot be or suicidal ideation that cannot be um, seemingly um, treated in any other way. However, there are two newer treatments and there are other ones being developed. Two of the new ones are ketamine infusions, um, which is a, uh, it was a um, recreational drug, but it's given in very, very small doses. And it actually seems to help uh, treatment resistant depression, especially bipolar disorder, interestingly enough. And also there's something called transcranial magnetic stimulation that uses a similar kind of reasoning um, as ECT, whereas you are directing magnetic stimulation to certain areas of the brain that have been shown to have to do with depression. And the magnet, um, this is a very everyday man kind of uh, explanation of this, reroutes the neural pathways uh, over about a 30 or 40 day period of time. Um, and the person feels better. So I, and there's no memory loss. So I would definitely talk to a doctor about transcranial magnetic stimulation or ketamine infusions before I would go to ECT. Now I'm not a medical doctor, but ECT does still have some uh, memory problems. It is, it is far better a treatment, however, now than it was years ago. Um, uh, can a person have both chronic PTSD and PhD? Do you mean PhD or do you mean PTSD? Is perfectly hidden depression. Oh, well, maybe you are talking about perfectly hidden depression. Do you see one condition cause or affect the other? PhD, uh, if you mean perfectly hidden depression, is not a diagnosis. And it's a term I made up. And it is, I didn't make it up out of whole cloth. It was based on my clinical experience. But it's a syndrome. It's a, there are traits and behaviors and beliefs that are found together just like codependence is a very well-known syndrome. Um, so you can have these, um, these behaviors and beliefs that are keeping you very rigidly compartmentalized and all your painful emotions are rigidly compartmentalized. It's funny, you should ask me this question because as I was looking at complex PTSD, I realized in her, one of her things that she said is that these people can look very like they're normal or that like they're functioning normally, they are normal, but they're functioning normally, but they really have this significant, uh, these thin, these traumas that are hidden. So yes, I think probably those things can be uh, uh, concurrent. However, I, I don't think they're one and the same. I think that a lot of people with perfectly hidden depression who identify or experience it or use it do not have complex PTSD because it's not always trauma-based. Perfectly hidden depression is not always trauma-based. It can be, um, you, you're not necessarily compartmentalizing trauma. You could be compartmentalizing just, you know, bad things and unhappy things um, and and um, neglect or, or, or abuse or whatever, but it's not, um, it also could be other things that are not necessarily deemed as trauma. Okay, Jules, I need to work that out. I was neglected by my mom, raised by my grandmother, but she died when I was four. Parents never paid attention to me. Well, that's neglect, Jules. And I'm so sorry. Um, 
what country, Lee, what country is this? This is the United States. Um, I have PTSD from my ECT treatments in 2013. It was hell. I'm terrified to have a general anesthetic again. Um, well, you know, I don't know whether your physician used ECT properly and appropriately because that is, I'm not an expert on ECT. I've had a handful of patients of mine have ECT and they really don't have much of a reaction to that. In fact, I don't think they were under general anesthesia at all. I think there is some anesthesia, but not general anesthesia. So I'm a little, I'm a little confused there. Uh, again, I'm not an expert on ECT, so I should probably not answer that question. Um, what are your thoughts about tapas acupre acupressure technique for helping people with trouble? I don't know what it is. Um, don't know what that is, Cassandra. So um, I imagine acu my guess would be with acupressure. I mean, I've had acupuncture. I've never had acupressure, but it's probably using, it has something to do with that somatic processing of trauma where you keeping the trauma inward. Um, I had, I was Alexander years ago. And for any of you who know anything about the Alexander technique, it's not actual massage. It's people who are trained in it actually just have their hands above your body and they're looking for, I guess, blockages or something like that. And I remember this is long. I was, I was a singer back then and they, this woman just had her hands over my body and, and I just started crying. I mean, huge sobs came out of my body and I'd just been talking away and I was fine. So I guess it's something like that, but I really don't know. Maybe you can uh, let us know what it is. Um, I'd love to have, um, okay, Jules, you were totally out. Okay. So again, you might look up more recent um, uh, ECT uh, designed kinds of things and see if that's still the practice. Um, maybe it is. I could be wrong about that, Jules. I certainly, um, again, am not an expert. Let me go through these things that are different between complex PTSD and borderline personality disorder. There are a lot of things that are similar. Um, both may really impact your personality development and your ability to trust. Um, you can have emotional dysregulation, simply meaning that your emotions kind of run amok and you don't really know how to govern them or, or rein them in. You could be dissociative, meaning that um, you kind of go somewhere else, um, that you have this sense of leaving the present and, and being detached from the present. Maybe even, I mean, dissociative identity disorder is actually that going somewhere else and actually uh, experiencing um, life as another uh, entity. That's not necessarily dissociation. You can just simply kind of, I mean, people who have been abused will tell me that associated and they sort of saw themselves at the, in the corner of the room and they were watching what happened to them. That is a frequent response to trauma. Um, there's somatic distress, meaning that your body, again, carries a lot of that pain. And uh, there's uh, identity and relationship disturbance. Identity disturbance is a little hard to understand. It kind of means, um, you know, in the, in the textbooks, it's called consistent sense of self. And what that means is that someone with borderline personality disorder will tell you, I never know who I'm going to be from moment to moment. I may be an angry person. I may be a loving, laughing, caring person. I may be, oh, I don't care kind of person, an apathetic person. And I never quite know who I'm going to be from hour to hour. And this is, you can sense this in someone with true borderline personality disorder because there are a lot of mood shifts. Um, and in fact, they could really maybe not remember being angry with you after they have been or angry. And then they shift into this different way of being and they don't really remember. They were dissociated enough where they don't remember that part of, the, of being with you. So, you know, most of the time, for example, if I have a day when I'm getting angry or or if I'm upset about something, I can sort of sense myself moving into that. I, I have a consistency of self where I can say, gosh, I'm really getting in a bad mood. People with borderline personality disorder will have an, a, more of an abrupt shift. Um, and obviously this causes disturbances in their relationships as well. 
So this, the overlapping symptoms with complex PTSD, again, this PTSD that's more governed by um, long-term, very long-term trauma, is impulsivity. But again, in borderline personality disorder, it's more pervasive. It happens a lot. And with a complex PTSD, it's more triggered. It's more episodic. It's not consistent. So someone with borderline personality disorder will, will often act very impulsively. In fact, one of the mantras I suggest to them is don't react, respond. How do you want to respond? If you're reacting, stop and think about how you want to respond. Um, there, there are four of these. There's impulsivity, then there's suicidality, which is a common between borderline personality disorder and complex PTSD. And again, it has sort of that same distinction where with borderline personality disorder, that sadly and tragically is more persistent, um, especially when in lower, what's called lower functioning border, uh, borderline, where literally, you know, every other week or sometimes every week they're, they're wanting to self-destruct or self-harm or do something that has to do with self-harm and even uh, hurting themselves um, with suicide. With CPTSD, CPTSD, that is more intermittent, more episodic, but it can happen. There's a sense of emptiness. I've had a patient tell me years ago that being borderline made her feel as if she had a black hole in her soul that could never be filled up. And I'll never forget that description. And um, again, same kind of distinction with borderline personality disorder. It's more pervasive. It happens more of the time. In CPTSD, this writer said it's more like numbness and not really caring. It's not as much of a yawning emptiness, like you can't get filled up. It's just sort of feeling numb. And then the last one was dissociative symptoms. Um, and in, in complex PTSD, it's a little looser. You could just feel kind of like out of, your, out of it or you're not real sure. You kind of feel detached from things around you. With more borderline personality disorder, you can actually have a sense of not even knowing where you are in space or um, feeling as if you're sort of, um, that your emotions are just carrying you to some place where um, uh, the people around you can't, you just can't communicate with them. So it can be more of a persistent thing. Um, the strategies for complex uh, PTSD um, are DBT, dialectical, be dialectical Behavior Therapy, which is a special offshoot of CBT. Uh, you want to learn tolerance strategies. You've got to learn how to tolerate and manage your emotions or soothe yourself. And you, you need to be very secure in your therapeutic relationship. You need to process your trauma and learn self-care and self-compassion. Um, that self-care and self-compassion stuff is really true for most mental illness. Um, Nikita, any tips past PTSD and life aging changes, growing older where it's still a part of you? That's a great question. Um, I think that if you're, if you're, older and you still have PTSD, I think that may mean that you haven't addressed it, but some PTSD has staying power. Um, you know, you'll get, a, somebody will have a look in their eyes and they'll say, I'll never forget what it felt like to be somewhere. And so again, encouraging them to talk about it rather than avoid talking about it, which is the tendency to avoid talking about it. But the more you talk about it, especially with someone who's secure and you trust, the more it helps. Okay, we're almost time out. It seems like I'm um, treated like a criminal when I'm having PTSD symptoms. Is that common? Alex, um, you know, you're not a criminal. Um, it, it, I, you know, certain presentations of PTSD are probably scarier for some people than others. Um, if you tend to get really angry, if you tend to kind of lose your ability to stay in the present, people can see that in your eyes. And I'm, that can be if you tend to drink a lot or use drugs a lot to try to um, contain it, then that can be scary for people. Um, so, you know, again, just trying to get yourself help. Um, but, but it's certainly you're not a criminal. This is a real thing that happens. Uh, it is not that you're weak. It is a understandable and human response to trauma. 
Last question. My new therapist has started using uh, internal family systems with me. I've had a few profound sessions with her. Will that be helpful not for my PTSD? Becky, what research shows? Internal family systems is a fairly new, I've, I've attended a seminar on it. And to me, it, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. It is a, a way of understanding sort of how you sort of see parts of yourself and parts of your life as um, in parts of whatever, as a family and how they're interacting. If it's profound for you, then it will help you whatever is in front of you. This research shows that all the meta analyses, as they call, as they're called, if your therapist is good at whatever technique he or she uses, and you believe in them and you trust them, and they are using their that technique proficiently, then you're going to get better. I know that may sound a little wackoed. Like, well, what do you mean? It doesn't, it doesn't matter what the therapist does. If, if they're using that technique well, whether it's cognitive behavioral, whether it's internal family systems, whether it's EMDR, whether it's trauma-based work, whatever it is, if you, they are using that therapy well and y'all have a really good, solid therapeutic relationship, then you will get better. Okay? All right. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Um, I'm on The Mighty when a Facebook Live or Mental Health on The Mighty every third Wednesday of the month and now at three o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, you can reach me on my own podcast at the Self Work Podcast with Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Come on over to my Facebook page at facebook.com slash Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm at the same on Instagram, uh, instagram.com slash Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Um, I do have a closed Facebook group which is facebook.com slash groups slash self work. It is not a therapy group. It is a support group. And we don't uh, have any kind of religious or political ideologies that are expressed there. If that is interesting to you, then come on and try it out. Enjoy us. And join us. Don't forget to answer the questions and I'll let you in. Um, my book is Perfectly Hidden Depression, How to Break Free from the Perfectionism that Masks Your Depression. And perfectionism and suicidality are going up, and it is very, very dangerous. And it is another presentation of depression that is harder for mental health clinicians to see. And yet, if we all know that something looks a little better than it should, you know, then maybe we need to ask further questions. Um, for example, someone said to me one time, don't ask me the question, would you reveal if you felt hopeless? I would say no. Um, yeah. No, don't ask me. I'm sorry. I got that screwed up. Don't ask me if I'm hopeless. I'd say no. Ask me, would you reveal if you felt hope hopeless? I will still say no. And that's a clue to what's going on with me. So I appreciate so much being here. Thank you to camera who helps me that. I'm sorry for those of you who saw me uh, doing my blouse and looking around my room and making sure. You know, I'm sorry. I'm just as vain as everybody else. So anyway, I, I love seeing y'all next month. And um, thank you for being here. So appreciate it. Take care. Bye for now.